Hi, and welcome to our next lesson in this study of Ezekiel in this growth class series. We have covered a lot of ground in the first few weeks of the uh, this study of Ezekiel and going to slow down just a little bit today, focused on one chapter, uh, that being chapter 12. Let me give a little quick little background here of where we are uh, up till now, uh, going into chapter 12, and then I'll open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right in. So up till now, what we've seen in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel was a prophet uh, called um, around the time of uh, just several years before the uh, the major uh, destruction of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple and uh, the Babylonian captivity of God's people around 586 B.C., uh, Ezekiel was called as a prophet several years before that, um, was actually part of, the, the exile actually took place in a couple of phases. There were a couple of smaller um, portions of exile that took place before the major one in 586, and Ezekiel was part of one of those first, one of those early ones several years before 586. And where the people are at this point, God's people have um, they've, they've merged with the world's ways, um, even to the point of uh, detestable uh, idol worship and, and things that, uh, that, that they're, they're involved in. They've turned from God, they've broken covenant with them, um, turned, turned astray from God's ways and God's commands. And God through this uh, Babylonian captivity and and so forth is uh, about to uh, about to bring judgment on that and and turn uh, turn back uh, his people and restore his ways through this discipline um, other prophets have continued to warn the Israelites as well um, and, uh, and Ezekiel um, comes along now with the uh, with the mission to to do that. And so what we've seen up till now is um, the visions. Uh, Ezekiel was a uh, was given these visions uh, to prophesy in a very uh, very visual acts of um, in his message that he did before the Israelites, as we've seen. Uh, up till now, and again here in chapter 12, we're going to see. So they're now approaching the complete destruction of Jerusalem. Again, approaching that 586 BC time frame, where the complete destruction of Jerusalem and and of the temple, and the captivity uh, is about to uh, about to take place. In chapter uh, 12, is kind of a summary of of that. And that warning, in in this uh, very pivotal time in the Israelites' history, let me open us up in prayer, and and then we'll get right into chapter twelve. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and your truths. And Father, the, these accounts of um, your uh, bringing in your kingdom. And and Father, uh, judging and and conquering the uh, these evils and the 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 wickedness and the things that were taking place, Father, that were opposed to you. For Father, you will have the glory, and you will reign, and you will bring in your kingdom. And we thank you for that, and thank you for these accounts of that, and these reminders and lessons to us for this day of how we should take heed. So, Father, we ask that you'd open our hearts and help us to hear you and hear your word in this lesson. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, chapter 12 starts right off in the first two verses 
with basically giving us the why. Why is God acting in this way? You know, the book of Ezekiel is about a lot of judgment, um, a lot of, you know, doom and gloom, if you will. Always, though, with the, uh, with the message of restoration in there. Because, God, again, what God is doing here is he's, he's, he's not going to put up with these evils anymore. Um, he will have the glory. And he will, his kingdom will reign. So a lot of this is dealing with judging that that's opposed to him and turning his people back to his ways. So a lot of judgment and a lot of that. But the reason for that is because of the people's turning away from him. Uh, these aren't just random acts, and God's just not a, you know, as some would uh, as some would see the Old Testament, just this wrath and this, you know, why would God do these things? Well, He would do these things to um, judge the evil and judge the wickedness, but turn His people back to His ways. And the reason he needed to do that is because they had turned aside. They chose to turn from him. And that's what we hear in these first two verses described. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, who have eyes to see but see not, who have ears to hear but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. So right away in these first two verses, we hear the, the term rebellious. These are rebellious people. And the eyes to see and ears to hear. Back in chapter 2, we've already heard this kind of language when, when Ezekiel was called by God. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 7 said, The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them, and you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Through, uh, Though briars and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. House, and you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. Hear the repetitiveness in that rebellious house. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, what what is a what does it mean to be a rebellious? What's a what's a rebel? If you look up the definition of rebel in the uh, in the dictionary, um, one definition there is to oppose or disobey one in authority or control. Certainly that's the case here, opposing, disobeying the one in authority. And it's important to note here that this isn't just a subtle opposing or just a subtle that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is a willful resistance to God's ways where he says they have eyes to see and they have ears to hear, but they do not. They refuse to. They have turned away. In Jeremiah, uh, who was a uh, contemporary of Ezekiel's during this time, uh, Jeremiah the prophet in uh, chapter 5, verses 20 through 24, said this, Declare this in the house of Jacob, proclaim it in Judah. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand as the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives us the rain in its season, 
the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. And he goes on to describe more there. And basically what is being said here, it seems, is that um, what's being described is these people as a who who have these stubborn and these stubborn people with these rebellious hearts who have turned aside and gone away from the Lord, meaning they're refusing to recognize the God, the creator and sustainer of their lives. You know, these things he mentioned there in Jeremiah about do do you not do you not understand? I'm the one that created all this, all this around you, the oceans and the sands on the shore and um I bring the rain for your harvest. They're they're refusing to recognize the creator of everything. The creator of this universe, the sustainer of their lives. And they're turning to the world's ways which are opposed to God's commands. And don't recognize God as, as the creator and sustainer of their lives that he is. In Isaiah Chapter 65, verse 3, it says, When I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen. But you did what was evil in my eyes and chose what I did not delight in. So again, hear hear the willful resistance to God in this language. I called, you did not answer. I spoke, you did not listen. You did what was evil. You chose to do what I did not delight in. So make no mistake about it. God is a righteous judge, a righteous God, um, has every bit the, the, the right and the, uh, to, to judge what's going on here. So again, not just random acts of wrath. He's just not a, a God of wrath for the sake of that, but the sake of um, dealing with unrighteousness because... Again, God will have his righteous kingdom. So all along, again, we hear throughout this message and and listen for the the threads of of the objective being restoration of his people in his kingdom. But it's definitely because of their own personal sin and corporate sin that he is reacting in this way. Some application here we might get right off the top just out of these first two verses. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 and 17, Jesus told his disciples when he was explaining his speaking in parables and what that was all about. And the idea that that you have to have ears to hear and eyes to see to understand those things. That being God has opened your heart, opened your eyes. And Jesus says to the disciples, Blessed are your eyes for they see and ears for they hear. And this idea again of the eyes to to see and ears to hear. And are we are we doing that? <laughs> are we are we seeing God? Are we hearing God? For he's given the believer the eyes to see and the ears to hear. God is at work in the believer and all around us. He is the creator of all and the sustainer of our lives. Do I recognize that? Do I see that? Do I see that in the events around me and in the world? Am I hearing him in all of this? Which am I? Am I am I that? Am I seeing, hearing, and obeying the God of all creation and the sustainer of all and Lord of my life? Or am I being a rebel? Something to ponder. We then get to the next couple of sections here in our passage dealing with uh, visual aids that Ezekiel carried out to bring these prophecies uh, to the people. In verses 3 through 7, it's uh, Ezekiel was was told to, um, in verse 3, 
Prepare for yourself an exile's baggage and go into exile by day in their sight. You shall go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. And then he goes on in the next few verses there uh, with a little more detail about, um, you know, uh, packing his bags and and taking his baggage, um, you know, with him and leaving and um, talks about, you know, going digging through the... uh, in verse 5 there, in their sight, dig through the wall, bring your baggage out through it. Uh, in your sight, you shall lift your baggage upon your shoulder and carry it out. Uh, you shall cover your face that you may not see the land. All this, he says, for I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. In the next several verses there, he explains what this is and in, in, in what's coming and what this prophecy specifically is speaking to. But in these uh, several verses where he's describing or giving Ezekiel the instructions on what to do in this packing a bag and and leaving with his baggage, notice he says several times in here, in their sight. Again, back to that that idea of are they are they awake and <laughs> what's going on around them? Are they are they, you know, how are they, how are they viewing this and seeing this and understanding it? And, um, you know, the verse he even read there, he said, perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. If you're in rebellion and you're hardened, it's hard to see God. So he gives them this idea of carrying out this, uh, this uh, again, uh, symbolic act. And in the next several verses, verses 8 through um, eight through 15, or 8 through 16 or so, he explains what it is. He, he says uh, in, verse, in verse 8, In the morning the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, What are you doing? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, This oracle concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are in it. Say, I am a sign for you. As I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall go into exile, into captivity. And again, he goes on in the next few verses to explain a little detail there. And this, uh, things like... uh, Again, he talks about digging through the wall. They will dig, verse 12, they will dig through the wall to bring him out through it. He shall cover his face that he may not see the land with his eyes. And in particular, we're talking about King Zedekiah here, who at the time was the king when this, the major uh, captivity and destruction of Jerusalem and temple took place in 586. We can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 25. Uh, Jeremiah also, chapter 52, refers to it. This idea here, this prophecy of he will not see it. His face will be covered. And, you know, digging through the wall and and being uh, being taken captive. And you can read all that. That's, that's how it happened for him uh, back then when he was trying to flee when the Babylonians came in. In fact, they this idea of that he won't see the land. Uh, they actually, as you can read back there in those um, passages I, I pointed out a, a minute ago, um, that they uh, actually gouged his eyes out, and um, and and he says, uh, you know, in verse thirteen here, uh, and I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, and he shall die there. And that's exactly what happened to him. So what this whole idea of, you know, carrying the baggage out and all those things were a, a symbolic act of the fact that all of them will need to pack their bags, if you will. They're going on a trip. They're going to be taken into captivity. Um and then a little detail there on uh, King Zedekiah uh, himself. 
But in verse 16 there, as, as he does throughout, and we said earlier to listen for, But I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine and pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the nations where they go, and may know that I am the Lord. Again, the, always the objective here, uh, and, and God will leaves a remnant. He leaves those by His grace. He, he wouldn't have to. He would be perfectly righteous in wiping it all out, wiping us all out. But by His grace and His love, for His covenant with His people, He will leave a remnant, and ultimately He will get the glory, as He says there, and they may know that I am the Lord, which He repeats here a couple of times uh, throughout this. Well, there's another symbolic act now in verses 17 through 20. And this one, um, let me just read those for us real quick. Uh, And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, eat your bread with quaking, and drink water with trembling and with anxiety. And say to the people of the land, Thus says the Lord God concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with anxiety and drink water in dismay. In this way... Her land will be stripped of all it contains on account of the violence of all those who dwell in it. And the inhabited cities shall be laid waste, and the land shall become a desolation, and you shall know that I am the Lord. This idea of anxiety, why why would he give them this symbolic act, symbolic act that they need to um, be going about with anxiety, with much anxiety? Well, again... Referring back to the dictionary and definition of anxiety, one definition, painful or apprehensive uneasiness of mind, usually over an impending or anticipated will. Uh, Ill, I'm sorry, anticipated ill. The people were going to have plenty of reason to be anxious, were they not? They're being judged here. And God isn't going to go easy on them. This captivity and destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple, they were about to go through something very serious, some very serious judgment. And as Ezekiel uh, in this symbolic act is letting them know, um, yes, with the relationship that you're currently in, with God the Creator. Yes, you should be very apprehensive, very anxious. And that they will. And then in verses 21 through 28, there's this theme of the people are thinking that, well, all this that you're telling us and you're trying to tell us You know, where is God? None of these things ever really take place. Read along with me in verse 21 and a few verses thereafter. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, what is this proverb that you have about the land of Israel, saying, The days grow long, and every vision comes to nothing. Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb, And they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say to them, The days are near, and the fulfillment of every vision. Skipping down to verse 25, For I am the Lord, I will speak the word that I will speak, and it will be performed. It will no longer be delayed. But in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord. And then again at the end of, in verse 28, at the end of this section, in the end of the chapter, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, None of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord. You see, they were listening to, the people were listening to all these false prophecies, and they bought into this lie that, well, none of these things ever take place. This isn't going to happen, not in our lifetime. Yeah, the future's bright. Everything's just fine. 
and when in fact it wasn't. Again, they were blind to it. They're, they 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 weren't using their eyes to see and ears to hear. This uh, proverb in Israel it talks about this is the false prophecy, and false prophecy is never sourced in God's promises, but true prophecy that is sourced in God's promises in God's word, the word that God speaks will be carried out. And we heard that we heard that language uh, a few times throughout the passage we just read, where God says. Um, I will speak the word and perform it. And furthermore, he's letting them know, and this that I'm telling you now is happening in your days, O rebellious house. It's right around the corner. And they didn't even recognize it. They were they were hardened to it and blind to it. But you know, again, a little application here. If we were to admit it to ourselves, we'd probably do the same thing. We're, we're so impatient. We want to judge things and assess things just by sight and not by faith, not by what's around us, what, what the God's Word and, and His promises. And even though those that are still afar off or, or not, or we don't know, but faith in that every promise God, will, God has made, He will carry out. And don't judge things just by what you immediately see around you. But we do the same thing. And then you can't help but wonder, when it did take place, these people that heard this and got these prophecies from Ezekiel, did they recognize it? Did they think back and say, oh, that's what Ezekiel was, was talking about? Things like when, if you go back and read the account of when Zedekiah... Uh, dug through the wall and then they uh, you know they 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 caught the Chaldeans caught up with them and spread their net over them and captured them and um that was god that was god uh at work there carrying out exactly what he had told Ezekiel to prophesy there the people at the time might have been looking at that blind to that, just looking at it, thinking, yeah, just another uh, set of world events and acts of man and instead of seeing it for what it is. But maybe we do the same thing. That really brings us to maybe some closing summary application here. How would God assess how my how I'm doing? with my eyes to see and ears to hear him eyes to see him and ears to hear him God has and continues to remind all throughout time that he is the creator of all and he is Lord and his kingdom will be carried out to his glory forever What are our thoughts on the events around us? What are we seeing, hearing? How are we assessing that? Is it through eyes and ears for the Lord? We would call that, you know, maybe our worldview. What is our worldview? Is it biblical or otherwise? As we ponder this life and the events and the things around us, and thinking about the future. The um, NIV application commentary says, These truths throughout all time and that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God are today considered out of place. We want to think only positively of the future and in our own positive thinking and making our own way and that all will work out just fine. How many times do you hear that? You know, the power of positive thinking. You know, we will... You can do anything if you put your mind to it. We, we will make our own way. But that's just not reality as to who we really are and what this world really is. 
and who God really is. That commentary goes on to kind of make a even deeper point of all that, that biblical perspective is ruthlessly honest about our failures and their consequences. We don't want to listen to that, do we? We don't want to, you know, we don't... The Old Testament, we don't want to study that. That's God's wrath, right? That That's old. God is the God of love now. That would be the, the attitude for many today. And He is a God of love. The wrath comes out of love, the discipline out of His love to save His people. And for those whose eyes are open to the truth and ears are open, open to the truth and in hearing that and understanding that those then are persuaded to flee to the refuge that God offers and only God can offer in his grace but you know then there's another prevailing attitude today some focus only on his love and skip the reason why his grace is needed. That being the other thing I, I just read, that the, uh, the honest truth about our sin and our failures and their consequences and why we need his grace. It's hard to understand why we need God's love and grace if we don't understand our need for it. And some today want to skip over that and say, no, you know, He's a God of love. Again, that's the Old Testament God, the God of, of wrath. He's a God of love. So even if they're recognizing God at all, they're only recognizing part of God, which then really isn't recognizing truly God for who He is. But they only want to recognize what's going on in the world and all those things that Again, God is a God of love and, and what we are and, and, you know, all these things and what we do. And um, it's, it's just who we are. It's how we were created. And certainly the God of love understands that and would never not accept all those things that, are, that his word tells us are detestable to him and in opposition to him. But the lie would be that, no, he's a God of love. And he would never not accept you for just exactly who you are and what in what you do. Because that's just, just the way you are. That's very dangerous thinking. And in all of that, and back to the maybe application from from some of this chapter regarding the anxiety level, our anxiousness about the future or even about life currently. Living out of covenant, living in covenant with God in a right relationship to God in obedience to Him brings us peace and resolves that anxiety. It's not that we don't have anxiety or aren't anxious about, you know, events that come along in life. There are certainly plenty of things that are stressful and raise our anxiety level. But ultimately, overall, regarding our future, regarding our very eternity, a life of acceptance of His grace alone for our salvation and in obedience to Him brings that peace. But living out of covenant with Him, broken covenant with Him, in things opposed to him, such as was going on here in Judah. That is cause for true anxiety, just like he told them. Because there is no peace. There is no inner peace there. These Israelites were being warned that they need to get back to God's ways. What about us? Where's that peace for us then? Listen to what we're told in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, and then Romans 5, chapter one, or verse 1. 
Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The answer for the Israelites was to turn from their evil deeds opposed to God and the covenant he offered them and to turn to obedience to him, his ways, out of his gracious love, which is what he wants, what he gives, and he wants the best for his people to his glory. What about us? What can we learn from this account from the Israelites and the judgment that came upon them as we ponder our own life and our own relationship with God in our own future, in our own anxiety level? Through Him and Him alone and salvation in His grace and His love and by the righteous act of Christ on the cross, through that is our true peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and your grace and your righteousness, Father, to wipe out the evil and the wickedness and the things of this world that are opposed to you and to preserve your kingdom, Lord, and to preserve us, to preserve all who would look to you and Christ alone for that salvation and that peace. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.